Okay, uh, welcome to Sex Scale, September 30th. I linked the doc in chat. Uh, please add yourself as an attendee. And feel free to add things on the agenda. Okay, uh, let's start with the first item. Um, add all the scripts and configurations in the upstream CI CD system to configure the perf cluster. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, so this is to configure uh, the, the performance cluster in the CI CG system. So after, I, uh, well, I did many tests to, to verify the performance. Now I want to include the system that I was testing to uh, the CI CG system. And then we will have all the performance jobs that we discussed before running there. Um, it's merged now, so, um, but it's, it's still like missing some, uh, you know, some jobs to create the cluster and, and do that. So I'm, I'm doing that with, uh, Frederico that's responsible for the CI CD system in Kubevirt. So, um, hopefully we'll, we'll get this cluster, you know, uh, ready soon. And so then, what is uh what does this mean like the the six scale cluster like this is a um like a dedicated job or cluster or something that is that's run for things that we want to test or is like uh can you describe this a little more yeah so right now we, there is like a cluster to run the functional test okay so every time that someone writes a pr it has the functional test run, unit test and functional test running, mm -hmm. and it runs in this uh, special cluster. However, it's shared with many jobs, and it's, I would say it's kind of impossible to have any performance job there. So we'll have another cluster that will run the performance test there, and the test should be isolated, will not be collocated to any job. We're running bare metal. For mm -hmm. the functional test, actually, it has... Uh, well, the way that works, it creates a VM, install Kubernetes inside, creates a cluster. So it's used nested virtualization. So the functional tests, it's not, it's not uh, regarding performance. Okay, so it's just as the you know, functional test. So we have the dedicated cluster in bare metal nodes um, that will run the performance jobs that we were discussing. We are planning. So um, okay. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, pretty cool. So this is um, so eventually like <clears throat> this is like we have this cluster. We can start doing a little bit of you know, generating some baselines, some thresholds. Um, that continuing to you know this is basically where we'll it will put a lot of those things like we'll um, to uh, to test like all our performance things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Is that, uh, is that all uh, you had there, Marcelo? Yeah, just something that I want to mention before uh, saying, uh, I will be on PTO uh, from October 1st to, to 30, so the whole October, okay? So just to, to mention to you guys that. Okay, we'll miss you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Marcelo. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, memory usage of cluster profile around large clusters. Let's take a look. Yeah, so so that's me. Uh, hi guys. Uh, so I was experimenting with Cluster Profiler, which was recently merged, uh, and I had some problems with running it on the large clusters. Um, uh, so I noticed that there's uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with start and stop logic uh, request logic. Uh, they're like simply broadcast, but there's a dump request. Uh, which basically works like this, that Virt API gathers in memory uh, all of the profiles from each of the QVirt pod, pods, right? So I noticed that single pod produces like around nine megabytes uh, of uh, profiles and profile results. Uh, so it means that we, when, we are trying, when we try to run at scale at this profiler, uh, we quite fast get out of memory errors because when we calculate 500 nodes, 
assuming like for weird handlers on each node, we can get 20 gigabytes of, of memory usage by weird API, which, uh, yeah, which sometimes it's just uh, unfeasible. So I have some thoughts how to, uh, how to, how to fix this, uh, but I was just uh, thinking if you, if you guys have an input on this, how, how would you like to approach it, especially uh, David, who was the, the author of the original, uh, of the original solution. Yeah, this is really interesting. Sorry, there's a ton of background noise. I don't know how distracting that is to you all. Uh, it's my chainsawing a tree behind me. Um, I don't have any immediate thoughts other than to minimize uh, the number of nodes that we profile at a time. So you have some sort of selector on, on just make sure we don't get all of our handlers. For example, that's probably the one that's causing the most problems. Uh, and maybe there's some optimizations to how we gather and dump uh, these. It doesn't require it to all be stored in memory. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts? Because it sounds like you actually have an environment where you can uh, do this sort of thing. Uh, yeah. So, mm, yeah. So I was thinking that we we don't need actually have your API to gather all the results in in memory. We just basically can change a bit the API by which uh, we fetch the profiler results, right? So we can basically, from a client side, we can we can query your API uh, one pod by one, for instance, right? Uh, or like change dump requests, uh, like for qubit pods to actually dump the results into into their volumes, and then have a client to actually uh, traverse all of the volumes and just you know copy the results into into client's uh, own uh, file system. Uh, yeah, so here these are like my two like initial ideas how we how we should solve it. Basically, just just remove these cluster profiler results. A struct which uh, which is present uh, because as I mentioned there, I think it like won't fit into memory for a large large scale. Uh, yeah, so if you guys don't have any like uh, strong opinions on this, uh, I guess I just try to propose my implementation. Like I think it it won't be a big change, and I just uh, just see for input uh, them. I think the biggest thing I'd like to preserve is the ability to retrieve this information uh, without having to be inside of the cluster. So just using standard cube control or vert CTL uh, or cube CTL or CTL tooling outside of the cluster. Uh, because if we if we dump it to a volume or something like that, then somehow we have to get that information out onto our local like laptop, for example, or wherever we're going to be analyzing this. Uh, and if we're not doing it through the API server, then we have to deal with ingress somehow. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, I remember that. What I mean, how useful is, for example, all the BERT handler? Uh, information. I mean, it's, it's just, just as simple as saying uh, like a flag that um, somehow allow or deny list on what nodes you want to collect it from or whether you want control plane uh, on like a cluster control plane only. I guess is there a way to narrow down the amount of information that we retrieve in a way that um, <clears throat> prevents having to just send so much information? Are you actually looking at every BERT handlers uh, results or do you just want one for example yes so if you're talking uh, if you're talking about like hundreds of nodes scale like probably doesn't matter to weird handler uh, how many nodes in the cluster are right because it just looks at at its own environment which is which is a node so it's it's only a difference for let's say weird api or weird controller controller how many class how many nodes in in, in a cluster there are so I guess it makes sense as well uh, to like to add this, to do a selector for only control play nodes. So if you have if you have such a large cluster, then uh, then profiling weird API and weird controller that's useful. But maybe looking into every weird handler profiler results, it's it doesn't uh, it doesn't do much difference from the from the cluster of size, like few nodes, right? Mm, that so would be my expectation. Um, yeah, it would be it would be smaller. I don't know, yeah. but these are all really great 
thoughts. I'm glad you noticed this because uh, I did not notice that it was that much information. Um, yeah, that can be pretty bad. So I guess Bird API is just going to swell in the amount of memory it consumes. And then it doesn't really like memory is weird like that, where once it grows, it might not really shrink how much it's using. It just forever looks like it consumes a ton of memory. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the case. It's just uh, just tries to gather in, from, uh, in memory everything, uh, and once it has gathered everything, only then it returns the result to clients. So mm -hmm. maybe there's a way to do a zero copy transfer of that information as well. But I, I don't know how because the way I structured it, I have that um, that aggregate structure, the cluster profile results that stores everything. So it, that might not be practical either. Also, what's the biggest um, uh, result? Like, there's lots of different results that are returned. Is there one? Is it the memory profile that's the biggest? If, if it's just the memory, like the heap? OK, let's see. That seems reasonable value as heap. It's going to take around three megabytes. So yeah. yeah. We could just have a selection where you don't always want heap or Alex uh, as part of the results, and you care mostly about CPU or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. But at some point, someone might want to like use heap and Alex, and and what then? So I guess, sure. uh, I guess that uh, that having the solution which has all of the profiles and then doesn't use that man that uh, that many of memory, it's like feasible. So let's let's try it. And maybe have the selectors on the type of the of the pod and type of the profile, uh, somewhat optional, let's say. Yeah, makes sense to me. So, is the Vert API dumping that it's overflowing the memory, or is it when it's aggregating the Vert handler? Yeah, so the, the the memory, the out of memory errors, they, they happen when Virt API is trying to collect the response from each Virt handler, basically, and that's when when the memory overflow, overflow happens. Ah, um, oh, I see. So you so you, you have a map uh, map mm -hmm. uh, by each of the pod uh, as a key and as a value, just results of a, a profiling. So if you iterate over five hundred of of pods or even more. Then you know when you're reaching the uh, the second half of the pods, then you, you get out of memory errors. Mm -hmm. So maybe the future, because of the size, the future that David mentioned, like uh, if you can just say which node you want to get the virt handler, because maybe you just want to get from one one and it, and and then from the other components, uh, so, some filters might might work like that you know and probably or if another thing another idea might be like uh, if if you can filter you know per node then you can get like a you know a set of uh, of dump for a different time you know like you get like the first 10 nodes then you get from other nodes something like that instead of getting everything at the same time of course, it will be a different timestamp that you are going to measure, but is a way that maybe you can just you know have less inf information one in one dump. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think I think you would just have to agree on a like, subset of filters which which we should implement because uh, you know we have we can filter from the by the node name by the number of nodes type of mm -hmm. like weird spot but that's just maybe too much work uh, too much effort uh, which eventually could be reachable by some simpler uh, simpler filter uh, I, yeah. I, I my advice here is to pick the filter that makes most sense for your use case so if, uh, a selection of nodes that only profile um, uh, cube components that live on these set of nodes works for you then implement that. If uh, you just want to profile specific instances, like uh, only cluster controllers or uh, cluster controllers plus, I don't know, this vert handler, I don't know, 
one bird handler. I don't know. Uh, or if you want to limit uh, the amount of information you give back, say only give back um, CPU uh, results and not like a heap and alloy and whatever else we have. Um, figure out what makes the most sense for you. And I think you're like the primary consumer of this at the moment. So you have a lot of uh, say in what uh, what's best. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I have to think about it and I just, I just propose something. Sounds great. Yeah, and, and thanks for bringing this up. I'm glad that you um, are starting to use this. Did, did you get any results that were actually useful? I'm, I'm curious if you were able to act on any of those, or is it more still experimental, trying to get back some cluster profiles and to see what's useful in it? Uh, not yet. So I gathered a few profiles, but I have uh, actually spent recently some time trying to use GoTool PPro. So this is the GoTool, which helps you visualize the profiles, and there's some. Uh, the Go is complaining on the binary missing, uh, so it cannot actually correctly interpret the uh, the flow of the, the yeah the, the, the graph the you know uh, which function to which the you know the for instance memory heap grows like wh where are the allocs and so on. So I have to work on this and see if that's actually problem with uh, I don't know maybe my setup maybe my cluster or maybe that's that. That's something which uh, which needs to be done on the on the cube yeah, feature on the on the profiler. Uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I did the graph and things like that once or twice using the profile results just to make sure it worked for me. It did work. Okay. I, did it? Um, does it execute at all for you? Like, or is it just say you can't read the results? Uh, it says it says main binary is missing and the graph is just a one node graph or like something like this. So, uh, yeah, but. I just try a, a few different things, and uh, because if you if you're saying that uh, it used to work for you, but maybe that's something wrong with my setup. So it's yeah. also possible that there's a regression. Like I worked on this, and I don't know if I tested the last iteration of it before. I mean, I tested okay. that it would dump the results. I didn't try to interpret the results, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah, the last right. time I worked on this, so it's possible I have messed it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no worries. I, I try to figure it out. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Tomas. It would be really cool as yeah to see some of those those graphs. That would be we could put together uh, a bunch of cool images so that we can see. I'm sure we'll learn a lot from that. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Tomas. Um, I wrote as the item here. So for the with the action thing that we can go on is add a filter to limit the number of nodes pods that we can gather info from. Okay. Um, Next, uh, let's go to the VM pool discussion from David. Yeah, uh, so I don't want to spend the whole time on this like I did last time. Uh, I want to make you all aware of a couple of changes and uh, a couple of things that I'm thinking about as we're kind of we're getting close to finalizing this design. But um, first off, can you guys hear me? Is this like background noise so distracting that it's I need to read yeah, it? Yeah. Or, Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Not that loud. Yeah, it's fine. It's driving me nuts. Uh, <laughs> there's somebody with a chainsaw right outside my window, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through the day. But anyway, um, all right. So the biggest change that I made to the design was that after talking to Roman and really talking to others, they've kind of brought it up a few times. I've converged the virtual machine config into the VM pool uh, and made it. Uh, like a template section, similar to how deployments and stateful sets work, where you define you want deployment with so many replicas, and you actually have the template of the pod within the deployment. Uh, I have uh, a VM pool where you define the replicas, everything you want, and you actually have the template of the VM within the VM pool. And I was hesitant to this until I began thinking about the use cases that I wanted to keep them separate for, and I don't think they make sense. So uh, the reasons I wanted to keep them separate was I was thinking you could have a one-to-many relationship, where you could have one VM config uh, matching multiple VM pools. And the reasoning you'd want to do this is perhaps graduating a VM config uh, to production. And it turns out, I just don't think that makes any sense at all because uh, VM configs are going to be namespace scoped. You're not going to have your prod and staging and dev environments in the same namespace. And it's, it, it just doesn't make any sense uh, practically in the Kubernetes environment to me anymore. 
the other reasoning I came up with was you could have versioning of your uh, VM configs and you could um, have a VM config that you assign one version to the VM pool and then uh, create a new config where you have assigned the next version and you could roll back. But uh, deployments already have this kind of behavior where we save uh, a history of like a transaction history of all the different changes that have occurred to the deployment. And there's a revision history associated with each one of those changes and you can roll back. And if we're going to do that kind of behavior, I uh, should probably align with how other Kubernetes pr uh, primitives work today. So that's my thoughts. I think it makes the VM pool spec way more complex looking because we have both the uh, tunables related to how to manage all of these virtual machines uh, with the virtual machine spec itself and it's kind of verbose but maybe that's just the nature of what we're dealing with any thoughts about combining this virtual machine config with the vm pool does that sound okay to anyone everyone it's it's interesting the um yeah i mean I think, I think I've gone back and forth on this idea and that, um, so what I liked about the config was some of what, um, I think maybe the last thing you mentioned was the, it, it does simplify, um, it does simplify the, the VM pool object quite a bit. Um, I, I know when I was originally thinking about this idea, I think I used the, either the VM template or, or, or like a running VMI as like a, and, and using the object reference as like a way to like take that thing and just kind of multiply it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think we're kind of where I'm going with this is like, it, yeah, it does, having it in there, it does make it more complicated and, well, not more complicated, it just makes it more complex. And um, yeah, I, I, I liked the idea of having some sort of reference before, but, I mean, the technical reasons for it is really, um, it, I, I don't know, other than just simplifying is was really the only, the only reason that I had. Maybe it'd be easier to read, but that's that was kind of it. It felt better to me to have them in separate, uh, separate resources for the similar reason that you're you're talking about, where uh, I felt like it was easier to kind of grok what was happening. Um, but I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, I, I think that these are probably just expected, uh, expected uses patterns in Kubernetes now. So uh, I'm not sure that anyone would find that helpful as more as uh, confusing that these two objects exist rather than one object when they're used to standard Kubernetes primitives where uh, one object would exist and kind of embed the thing that you're going to re replicate. Yeah, it's, it's maybe always uh, worth calling you. Uh, we can't hear you very well, Roman. Your, your uh, mic's doing that thing. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Fabian always called it the cookie cutting cutter pattern, which everyone expects. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, here is really the thing what you will what will be used, and here is how often you will get it, and you have it on deployment, stateful set demon set, it's always the same thing. And also on other controllers, which bring down CRDs. Yeah. And yeah, yes, yeah, I can see, I mean, the object is big. That's really not so nice about it then. On the plus side, it feels really more natural regarding to normal Kubernetes management flows and how you would expect to update them. I think the thing I, I dislike the most about it being embedded is we have like layered templating. So you have a virtual machine <laughs> template and you have the virtual machine instance template inside of that. And it's just kind of... Maybe you call it Stanza or something. <laughs> I, I kind of hate, I, I hate the nested uh, part yeah. of this. But I can't that's, understand a line, that. that's a line. Yeah. And it potentially opens very understandable support for uh, commands like kubectl, uh, rollback and so on. Yeah. Because yeah, they are nowadays mostly generic so that then everyone can make use of them. Okay. So maybe maybe we can move past that discussion unless anyone has any really strong feelings about avoiding uh, the convergence here. 
No strong feelings. Nobody's offended by this. Okay. All right. So the, the last point I had here is uh, Roman and I were talking about this uh, ordered selection for scale in and the different selectors and things like that. And I want to make sure that we uh, document and have kind of a strong use cases for why uh, we need kind of these custom selectors and things like this to exist for selecting the virtual machines that are going to be torn down during the scale in process. Um, Ryan, I know this is one of the features you're most interested in. Um, do you have like a real world example of like how in practice you might use this? Yeah, well, we can, let me see. Um, I'm going to go to your document. You have them all captured in here, I think. Let's see. Uh, look at the, I had an example, I think. Um, was it in a comment or something? No, I think I, I put it in the open. Like I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, is this it? Here's a. Yep, that's the one. Uh, we can work with that. There's also um, one in the, uh, let's see. Yeah, I have one uh, automatic. OK, so there's, let's look at the example that you have. The, the exact same example is in the, um, in the document today as well, though. But OK. This is fine. Yeah. OK, the, OK, so start the, so label selector. Um, OK, so the, so for everyone in the background is that we were scaling in VMs as part of the pool. We have taken a number of replicas down from say 100 here to like 90. So what are the VMs that we are going to choose to terminate? Um, so the order policies are selected in order. First is the label selector here. So the, um, okay, so the idea behind this is that as, as like an admin, I know um, I have VMs running, um, but um, they're not, they're, um, they're not using a lot of traffic or they're um, not in use by someone or customer or something. So I know that those are safe to terminate, but they're still running because I, you know, I want to have them around in case, um, you know, running already in case that um, someone shows up and I can just provide them with a virtual machine. So I, they're, they're not important. Um, so I can remove them because I'm, uh, during the scaling process first before I want to um, remove one that is being in, in, being used by someone. Okay, got that one. Uh, that makes sense to me. Do you think you would ever need this kind of ordered? Um, do you just need one selector? Like say, uh, select ones with this, or do you actually need this kind of ordered policy where we need to go through a tier? Of, of different selections first. It's a good question. Um, I think um, it's it's I, it's hard to say. Like I, I think right now it's sort of um, it's like a it's an on or off switch. But I could very well seeing I could very well see the case where um, it needs to be more than that. Um, if if you know if I had to make a choice like between like if I had to choice between two bad options and you know one was I knew was worse than the other, um, this would be a way I can sort of delineate those two options. Okay, that makes sense. I, I think I can get behind that. Um, so that's the label selector. Uh, I, I can write a use case for that, and I think we're good. So the node selector. Hey. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so one question. So who marks, you know, who creates this label in the no, in the VM? Um, anyone could, like an admin. So what I was thinking, like when I was talking about these cases, that I was thinking that, like, um, we write some operator to do it, um, to do the labeling, um, or there would, whatever, some controller that would do it. But an admin can do it. Um, really, anyone, you know, that mm -hmm. has access to this API can do it. But I figured so, it would be done automatically. OK. So doesn't it make more sense actually to mark the ones that we don't want to delete? 
instead of mark the ones that can be deleted? Well, so we're we're doing since we're doing deletion. Um, it, so if we did it that way, that would sort of that that would be the reverse of the order, I think. Because yeah. like then, because we, I guess so to kind of start from the from the bottom here. Like we, the whole idea is that like we need to have, um, like, well, I mean, I guess we could do it that way, but like the the kind of the way we have it here is that we have we have one policy that's going to be that's always going to be true. Um, I, I guess like if you to do your suggestion, it would just be the, we would just look at the list in the reverse order. I mean, I, I don't, it, it, you get the same result, I guess. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's more difficult but, though, because you have new um, virtual machines coming online, you have to immediately mark them as don't delete them or I, I don't know. It, because I'm just thinking like, who is going to mark like, it's not important, you know? So it will be all all the nodes not important, and then you remove the nodes that are not important. I'm just thinking about the workflow, and it, it's not important because it's not running uh, important workloads in it. So um, I'm just thinking about the administrator, you know, the logic that someone is going to use that. I guess so, one example would be like, okay, there are less than five people logged in on these machines they should be should go first or there's no one logged in right now so they are preferred if you scale down and that can be done automatically just for instance the guest agent can report there's no one logged in you see that and you mark it yeah mm -hmm. and that's all automatically right and if someone logs in you remove it i mean there is an erase there i guess that's tricky but yeah Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can kind of live with that, I, that idea. I mean, but it most, it's mostly, yeah, like being able to, um, it, I don't know. I, to me, like it, logically, I kind of, um, yeah, I mean, go the way. I mean, it, it, that if to me, like I'll mark the ones that don't matter, but yeah, we could go, I don't know. I mean, we could go, I, I mean, I could, I think we can also solve for that use case, Marcelo, just by simply putting the, um, the most important at the bottom. Right. I mean, I can, I, I can, I can deal with it both ways. Yeah, yeah. Not but I, I really think what, 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 what the most common use case would be to mark the ones which are less important, which you want to take first. I really, that yeah. makes a lot of sense for many cases. That does appear to be the natural way coming yeah. from other management platforms. Um, okay, okay. Uh, can we look and, at the, yeah. yeah good. And, uh, and uh, what I also wanted to ask here on this section is, there's a base policy, oldest, for instance. What I'm, what I'm used to from other Kubernetes objects, which try to detect the best candidate, is that they have quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of criteria on how to test it. Like the oldest first, uh, but also the so oldest, not ready ones first, for instance. So there's kind of, and that's not the only one. There are also then it also considers how long uh, how long is your, your mic did that thing again. Yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I can kind of hear you, but. Okay, okay. okay so I, I just wanted to say the base policy sounds great. Is it this intent, but is this intended to override one out of criteria? Or is oh. oh my God, your mic is so frustrating. I, the, the, me, I mean, it's loud and then it's slow again. Right. Yeah. Come on, is, come on. It doesn't even. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you, you never upgrade. You never upgrade Fedora. I'm on like Fedora 3 or something. It's, <laughs> it's on like a, <laughs> a 20 year old laptop. Roman, I'll just speak to it because uh, I can't hear you. Uh, it's meant to be a catch all, um, a base policy where you go through the order policies and then if nothing hits and you set a base policy that it would it would land on that and we can set a lot of different options for that it could be oldest it could be newest it could be oldest and not i don't know like anything yeah, i just brought yeah i just yeah. brought it up because there are a lot of criteria which considered when doing a deployment <laughs> yeah i'm fighting it permanently it takes the uh, never mind. I give up. I give up. Go ahead. Well, how would you represent it then? If yeah, that's the question for me. Hmm. 
like um, on a deployment and replica set, it normally takes the newest one first because they're the least amount of ready. And then it takes uh, ready ones, so which pass the ready ones, uh, the readiness probe, they take them last and so on, right? There's quite a, a lot of. Is that configurable? No, that's all not configurable. Exactly. So, so yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. I just wonder when I have this one, will there be a subset independent of that one which tries to do additional smart decisions? Or is it just that? Independently of all this, I think that the first ones that are going to be selected are the ones that are shut down. OK. Yeah, that was another thing we talked about. Um, David, that was like a we. That was like we. Cause that could be an optimization, or I don't know if that. I don't know if you have that in the doc or something, or if it was something that could be turned on here. But that was a, or if it's something that's just assumed. Or what did what did we end up? Settling? I think that's assumed. And if you want to, um, so there's a scaling strategy called opportunistic, which will only scale in ones that you've terminated. Uh, so that's another path. But I think anytime there's terminated virtual machine laying around, that that's going to be the one that's selected, uh, regardless of any of this. Yeah, makes sense. OK. Um, the okay. selector. Can we yeah, well, talk about that for a second? What, that's something you brought up as well. I just want to make sure that we have a, a strong understanding of why we would want it. Pick a specific node. I understand the label. Let's talk about the node. Sure. So um, my thought behind this is that um, when if I am monitoring my node health, um, there are going to be times when I have a node that's unhealthy, and um, my intent is going to be that I kind of want these this node to be drained because it's unhealthy. Um, I don't know what's happening there. Um, I, I really like my workloads to scale down. So let's target those um, at a higher priority than ones that I know aren't healthy nodes. That's interesting. So the example is really a, a node that's being, is it, will we say that the node's being drained? Uh, so we're trying to shut down a node or something like that? Or are we saying that uh, you've detected that this node is acting strange, so you want to select the. What would be the difference between uh, a node selector and uh, some sort of automation that labels every VMI or VM on that node uh, as something eligible to shut down? Yeah, so um, with the label selector, I would expect, I expect to like the sort of the level of granularity to be or sort of the level of protection to be based on like, these are, you know, VMs that are just that I don't care that much about. So I'm first and foremost, like, that's fine. Let's just get rid of them. I don't really care. Um, if I need to then make another choice, you know, I've, I've run through those. Um, if I have no, a node, you know, maybe for whatever reason, it could be unhealthy. Um, it could be also that the hardware is not as good. Um, it could be um, a number of, things that um that i'd want to distinguish it to be killed next um anything that i run on the node maybe there's specific types of vms i run on that node um and those you know those aren't ones that um that you know that i'd want to kill next so i'll use um i use those nodes as my how to distinguish set of the labels i mean i could use labels here but i think the idea is that in addition to um this would be that it's like the node the node health, like something is going on with the node or something is different about this node that I would rather um, go to that node next for to kill. To kill I, the I, okay. So you, you point out one thing and I think it makes a lot of sense to me and that is the hardware is different on this node versus the other nodes. So I know in, in your case for what you guys are doing, uh, maybe there's, there's more expensive hardware, maybe there's uh, less um, uh, Maybe there's older hardware that you want to phase out over time or things like that. Uh, and you'd have the opportunity to begin draining things off of that node um, in a natural way, I guess. What would be different, the difference between, well, 
trying to think of that's the accurate way of doing that though or if you'd want to mark that node as unschedulable and begin shutting down uh the the workloads on that node uh, if, if it is going to be taken out of rotation or something like that yeah like i, I kind of the scenario i see is that like at this point um i have i, I may have marked it as unschedulable and that um you know i may even be attempting to evict at this point um, but I'm in a crunch now because, um, you know, whatever reason I need to bring down my number of v my number of VMIs, it needs to be scaled down. Um, and so at this point, I, I'm just deciding that like, um, okay, I've had enough, like these workloads just have to go, um, you know, they're maybe blocking because of eviction, you know, pod, whatever disruption budgets or something, but now we're, we're, we're deciding like it's time to, um, it's time to remove these these VMIs, and, and this would be like, you know, it's sort of the easier way to do it. So, I think this may collide with a few mechanisms which you can already use. Like one is the unscalable marking, you know, is unscalable. Another one is having uh, having on the the M pool template uh, affinity uh, affinities or anti affinities to specific labels, like you would like you you just decide once on the pool or on your on yeah for this pool that whenever a specific label appears on a node you prefer that new vms are not scheduled there then you get that kind of automatically there it's because what what i'm a little bit what's a little bit ugly with me on for me on the selection policy is what is then next so you say set the node select there but what but how would you then, for instance, what's the intention, the next intended step like? Do you expect that new VMs are also then not created there so that there is an anti affinity automatically added to, or is it independent? That's kind of hard to get from just this. Yeah, and I think I mean, there are ways to explain. Yeah, I think, um, I think in, yeah, I think in general. So, in general, like if I'm, if I like if just assume this is the only pool in my cluster, if I'm scaling it down, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any more VMs to land there because I'm not creating anymore. Um, so it, it could be a factor like that. So that could be true that like we, like just because of this as being my only pool, I wouldn't expect anyone to land there anyway. And, but it also could be the case that I, I've marked it as schedulable. Um, it, it could be either one. So I, I would be forceful and that, you know, you're not, no new ones are going to land there. But if, if I have a sort of a fixed count, then, then I know no new ones are going to land there. So you would expect that this would just do the scale in part, considering the node selector, but it would have no effect on yeah, scaling sorry, up dude. again or creating new games. Hey, or... You're going to have to uh, change your your mic. Uh, I did the switch yeah. with DNF, but it's still happening. So you <laughs> expect that this really just uh, affects the the scale in part, but would still do the same thing for creating new VMs or scaling up again, unless you do specific preparations with on the nodes that nothing can go there again. Or yeah, so okay, I guess like so if I um, if I'm scaling in, um, I could be I could possibly remove from node two, like I could remove yeah I could remove from node two, and let's say we scale up again. A, 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 a VM could land on node two. And that's like, I'd be okay with that. It would be up to sort of me to decide like, okay, if it's the nodes marked on schedule or not. I think, I think maybe the way to like, like the way I'm kind of looked at this is that we have label selector. This could technically classify, we could, we could label a VMI anything. It, it could, this could capture every use case. What this does is it, it it's sort of, it's, it's a subset. It, it sort of allows me to not have to have to label everything. It, it can I can also distinguish this way by note. It's sort of like a way I could, without having to deal with you know the cases where, um, like basically writing a controller that labels based on nodes and then you know having it in this field. I could just use this. It's it, as a as a way of doing it. And for all those reasons before, like you know because maybe the hardware is different. Maybe because um, I know it's not in a good state. Um, on you know, the nodes that needs to be remediated, whatever, um, any reason like that. So if it's because of hardware, 
shouldn't it have like also label like uh, if the hardware is different or if yeah, it has that, a gpu or nvme or whatever that's what i'm saying yeah like that's what i'm saying is that this these could fall under label selector but what i'm saying is that it's more convenient to have a field to, to have a field that explicitly states like okay we can control we can use vms on this node as the um we can use those as the next ones to be killed instead of having to create a label and mark the ones uh, per node and mm -hmm. then effectively doing that you know like effectively like i could literally like this could node two could be a label up here and i could mark all my vms on node two as node two and we could add them all on this list and i get the same effect but I i'm saying that this is quite a bit easier to just do it this way Yeah, I think it makes sense. It was just, just uh, think about the use case. Yeah. Well, does like so the the idea that it's like you know different hardware, different like node states, um, sort of like does that make sense as like a, a way like a reason why you like to me it does like that I I wouldn't want VMs like when I'm scaling down I want to take those are higher priority on my kill list because you know I just the node is not healthy I'm sort of you know, making that assumption that that we don't want healthy VMs to land on unhealthy nodes. And so that's why I'd want to have this here. Or rather the other way, I don't want healthy VMs to be running on an on, on, on unhealthy node. Yeah, but if a node is unhealthy, you, you mark it on unschedulable and you would start evicting them from there, right? Yeah, I should remove the nodes <laughs> that it's not healthy, so. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, you should remove the node. I mean, but but like, what I'm saying is like, if I'm managing this using a pool, mm -hmm. um, and and I'm doing, and I notice that there are VMs running on this unhealthy node, and I need to scale down, I would rather target those as as opposed to um, a healthy one. Like like, what what's my next option? It's the oldest one. Well, I could be targeting a healthy VM here. I would rather target these than I would rather target these. So this brings me then back to what, what I initially said regarding to that other scaled pool types in Kubernetes are doing more than just using the base policy. Like I would, for instance, expect that you have liveness probes and readiness probes on the VM and that. Yeah. That, um, uh, I mean, I, and if you're so, so that you can, so that would help you to get rid of VMs, which are not working properly with the liveness probe and readiness probe could potentially be a hint on what to take next and uh, readiness is different i don't know it makes yeah it's just it's just makes a lot of sense but yeah, I don't know yeah but liveness does it anyway you specify the liveness and if it fails the vm just gets killed and then it exactly. gets replaced and then we yeah. have a virtual so, yeah. machine that's not so, running on but, node. so uh, with healthy and unhealthy nodes what, what you normally will see there and i'm not sure if the scaling helps you there is that nothing happens automatically so you you then you could have the node selected there, and you your control our pool controller would potentially delete the VMs, but they would be stuck because the, because the node is the, is not behaving properly, so the objects don't get cleaned up from the kubelet. You get no confirmation. You have to do forced deletes. So yeah. I'm not sure if that helps you, or you need well, a, a fencing agent or something. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm in that case. Like I'm okay. Like in, I, I was gonna bring that up. Like when you were saying, like it's yeah. Like I'm okay with that because now my pool has like a correct understanding of like the cluster state. I can handle the re the remediated node like separately. I can be like, okay, that node's a problem. We're gonna deal with it separately. I don't, I don't want those VMs in my pool here. I'd rather just start a new one. You know, I'd rather like if I'm scaling down, I'd rather get rid of them. And then when I scale back up. You know, I'm not going to be like a like those are gone. Like I I don't I don't care about them. I don't. What I would rather do is get rid of one that I know is is on a misbehaving node. Then, like, yeah. You know, well, all I mean is that you potentially inventory. cannot get rid of it. Um, you you will probably. But, but that's okay but, though. Like, what's the alternative? Like, if the alternative is a healthy VM that's old, I would rather get this out of my inventory. Yeah, uh, all I mean is if uh, scale in, you would probably have to somehow, uh, that, then, then you're changing the meaning of the node. So it has a different meaning. So one meaning is 
okay, this when I scale down, delete these VMs first. Once they're gone, you create new ones, whatever. But what I just wanted to say is they do not go away. So you still have them in the inventory if the notice issues. So right. what, what, what would probably help you there then would more be something like, in addition to something like un max unavailable label, having something like an, uh, a second demo where you, where you allow, I don't know, potentially having 110 replicas if you kind of see that ten that a few of them are properly unhealthy and it's more important for you to have hundred ready ones than exactly having around hundred replicas. You know what I mean? I don't quite know what you mean. I, I like the my understanding on this is like if I if this if I know that this VM like we'll make the assumption here that it's on a node that's not responding. If I know this VM is is bad in my like when I say inventory, I mean the VM pools inventory. Like yeah. if I know that the the VMI here that I'm holding in this in this VM pool inventory is is on a node that is not responding, well, I I would rather not have that be in my VM pool um, than okay. So it has nothing to do with the node selector. So you would want to have it ignored automatically. So it's something different, you mean, or? No, no way. I don't understand what you mean. So, like, what, uh, ignore, what would be ignored? So, so what I mean is, you you have now this node selector thing here in the order policies, and you tell it's something like, uh, you can now. Do, uh, so, I have here, here different things here. One thing could be that node selector means shut these VMs down in a, a preferred. So, when you scale in, take them first. But you also mentioned something about unhealthy nodes. And there you have done the issue that you would have a different meaning for the node selector because it would mean that these nodes are unhealthy. And potentially, you, you cannot even delete the VMs there because you don't know their states, but you want them ignored now. That's the two cases I feared. So all I mean is we probably need to sort out more clearly what, what cases we want to tackle with what, because yeah. otherwise, it's just very overloaded with okay. what this means and what you would expect from it. It's getting a little Oops. complicated. Yeah, I was thinking both. Yeah, but you cannot put both into these fields. I think that's too much and too overloaded. That's what I mean. Here, I'm going to make a suggestion here, especially for the sake of time and getting this uh, worked on at some point, virtual machine pool. Um, why don't we follow up with the no selector or whatever this is um, after this, uh, maybe the initial implementation takes place. and. Maybe that gives Brian, for example, you a chance to adopt VM pools and kind of discover the cases that you would uh, want to select things in different ordering, like in the real world, and then we can work through uh, those exact scenarios. Uh, because I, I'm not sure it's clear to me, node selector. So what I'm proposing here is to take node selector out of the uh, design document for now, keep these ordered policies, they'll just be label selectors and keep the base policy. Uh, with the understanding that we can expand the ordered policies to include things like node selector or perhaps something more accurate for uh, exactly what you're trying to target uh, in the future. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I, I think that's okay. Like I said before, like label selector, we, we can do everything that node selector is currently, like all those cases that I mentioned can be covered by node selector in one form or, or another. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think, it, well, the only the thing here is all the different reasons I mentioned it, it, it would be convenience, but it we can, you know, this is something that we can, like I said, we can expand on. If it's I, I think, that... I think I, I, I can understand all the cases you brought up. I'm just not sure if it's really convenient also in operation if you put them all into this node selector. So I think it's great if we have the chance to discuss the use cases for this separately to see where it best suits, because I think it will not all end up there, but yeah. Then, in general, yeah. So there might be, for example, Ryan, um, if we, we see the use cases that the node is unhealthy or unresponsive, we can start saying, all right, so VMs that are uh, running on nodes that are not reporting like their health check and everything, target those first. And then that's like a catch all where you, you don't have to actually list your nodes in this node selector. We're just going to do the right thing dynamically. Uh, so I think there's just some more thought that could be put into this to make it actually easier on, on you all. Uh, 
to, to catch these cases rather than having to set specific nodes in the VM pool. Yeah, I, I just want that we invest here in a pattern where we know upfront already for many of these use cases, you don't, do not only have to change the node selector here, but also have to change other places to get the effect you want. So should, yeah, yeah to, to make it more easy. Okay. Yeah, I, like I said, I, label selector, no matter what is, is serviceable, and if we need, if if there's when we talk about like state and readiness for like this, yeah, like that could be a whole large discussion. I mean, you've already, you already talked about the state of the VMI. I mean, node state is another one. Yeah, we could include that in there. Um, that's how we want to terminate automatically. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, the only other thing I like I mentioned, like I said, hardware. Yeah, I mean, again, we could do labels for that. So I, I think at least for the for the time being, like this would be the thing that could solve the use cases either way. And then, you know, if it becomes something that, you know, whatever, if it's just a pain, like we just need to expand it because we can have a clear use case on whatever labeling or something, you know, based on nodes, then, then that's fine. We can talk about this. Okay, so I'll capture this in the document. Uh, I'm gonna take out the node selector and the examples, but I'm going to make a note uh, about this discussion and uh, kind of the future thoughts on what need to, uh, what we're gonna look at after, it's like a follow-up, I guess. This is a, uh, I'm documenting that this discussion has taken place and that there'll be a follow-up on how to handle this after the base implementation lands. Okay. Okay. I think this is really close. I think this could probably be worked on like in the next week. We just, I'd just like to get some, I'm gonna finish out this uh, last, hopefully last revisions. And then uh, I think I'd like to get one final, final uh, round of feedback where people give, hopefully it looks good to me. And then this might be something I can start working on. Cool. <clears throat> nice. Okay. Um, all right, cool. We got some notes in here. Good. And then, all right, I think we're at time. Um, any last, final thoughts here, last few seconds from people before we conclude? Okay. All right. Thanks for your time, everybody. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks.